goodness and grace of God. And uh, really thankful for Marlene's uh, message to the children. It's a message to all of us. About that God wants to root out sin in our lives, uh, not just because it's ugly to Him, but because it's destructive to us. And He wants good for us. And so I'm thankful for that communion to be able to remind us of the, the price that it took for God to be able to cut sin out and forgive us and save us. Um, we have uh, many prayer requests uh, to share together. And I think there was at least... I wanted to add to uh, what says uh, Tom Hanna, Beth Bentram's father. Uh, he was on a trip out west. He was in Wyoming and had a sudden uh, cardiac arrest, and they weren't able to treat him in Wyoming. They were able to keep him alive and then transport him over to Montana, where he's currently in Billings, Montana, and he had a successful uh, double bypass on <coughs> Tuesday or Wednesday, and then he's going to get a stent put in uh, when he's well enough and recovered from the first surgery. They're going to put a stent in uh, to further strengthen his heart. Then, um, I just want to double check, there's Okay, uh, we want to pray for um, Liz and Josh's family. We've been praying for Liz's father, Ken, uh, for a good many months, and uh, he went to be with the Lord yesterday. And so uh, we're thankful that he's in the arms of Jesus, And but there's going to obviously be a part of the family of God missing here and part of Liz and Josh's family missing. So we want to pray for them and their family, and uh, just uh, that as we... As we missed our loved ones that have gone before, that we can also celebrate their lives and look forward to that glorious and joyful reunion uh, when we get to see them and our Savior. And any other prayer requests that we may share together as a family of God this morning. Brian. Just keep uh, me in prayer because I've got it in about two weeks, I've got to go in. You've been taking dialysis for two or three weeks, two weeks um, <coughs> and you're getting a permanent line in uh, next when week. I'm, I'm not this Thursday, but next Thursday, I meet with a cardiovascular surgeon, whatever, to find out which thing he wants to fix. Okay. So next Thursday, you meet with him and then schedule that procedure. All right, let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for that um, sacred communion meal that we can share together, Lord. Thank you for giving us uh, something so simple as being baptized in water uh, to demonstrate our faith and then of, of uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper together, just a, a piece of bread and, and, and the fruit of the vine in order to remember and proclaim his death until he comes again, Lord. Thank you for making it simple and thank you that we can come to you uh, whether for the first time for salvation or repeatedly as children, simply through faith. And at this time, we trust that your Holy Spirit transports us uh, to your throne room, in which we come and call you not only God, not only Savior, not only Lord, but Father. And what a blessing it is to be your children. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will search us out and root out those things that are destructive to us, that, uh, that bring dishonor and shame to the, to the cause of heaven in the name of Christ. Lord, we want to make you happy. We want to please you. We want to bless you. We want to respond uh, freely and offer ourselves as sacrifice, living sacrifices in the way that you offered yourself as both a living and a dying and a risen sacrifice to our Heavenly Father. And Lord, we pray for all those who are on our, uh, our bulletin list and those who are on our hearts that, that, that the group doesn't know about, but we do, and those that we don't even know about, but you do that your spirit would pray, uh, search us out and pray uh, for us in utterings and groanings that cannot be spoken with human language. Uh, Lord, we just trust you to listen to the Holy Spirit and know what we need and how we need it and when we need it and how much of it we need and to do uh, exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or imagine. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, we are going to finish up. Let's... You know, God throws a lightning bolt at me through the week.
We're going to finish up in the book of Romans. And um, what a blessing. Now, next we're going to go to Job. We're transitioning from a book of deep doctrine to a book of uh, that's a book of poetry, a book that uh, maybe speaks to the heart a little bit more than the mind, but they're all necessary components of the Christian life. Uh, we don't check our brains at the door just because we have trusted in Christ. In fact, uh, because we have the mind of Christ, we know more about history, know more about science, know more about theology, uh, know more about humanity if we will believe the book than before we ever trusted Christ as Savior. So uh, we don't check our brains at the door, but neither do we get so heady-minded that we forget that there's an emotional response and there's, uh, there's, there's uh, uh, what we call a human condition that we live in and is part of us, and that's dealt with, I think, greatly in the book of Job. And there's also <clears throat> some really cool, weird stuff that I just enjoy talking about and studying. So uh, we'll get to some weird stuff, and then we'll get to some stuff about suffering and how to, how to suffer well and how to uh, maintain and, and, and even grow in hope through the midst of suffering as we look to our brother Job as, as an example and to God's response to him in chapters 39 through 41. But for today, uh, I'm going to finish up in Romans and uh, just have a couple things highlighted, a couple uh, just little pieces to pull out and talk about, and uh, it, won't, it won't take too long. It shouldn't take too long. But in uh, chapter 15, no, I'm sorry, I wanted to go back uh, quickly to uh, chapter 14. And he says in chapter 14, verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Uh, you know, it's amazing. I, I, uh, I was thinking about the Garden of Eden and how here's Adam and Eve in this perfect garden that God's created, a perfect earth that he set the garden in, and they are surrounded, according to Genesis chapter 3, they're surrounded by devils because... When uh, the serpent comes to tempt Eve and Adam with the fruit, he says, if you eat that, you'll be as gods. And Adam and Eve don't say, what are you talking about? They know exactly what he's talking about because they've seen these things. Uh, fallen uh, sons of God who have become devils and uh, you know what, what the world has uh, called gods. They call them Zeus, they call them Apollo, they call them Mercury, you know, basically all the names that we gave to our uh, rockets that went to the moon. Uh, and so... Uh, and thinking about how when God looked on the creation, he said everything was good. And that answers, this verse answers exactly uh, how you can say that when you've got these fallen angels or devils uh, floating around this beautiful garden and trying to tempt first man and woman to sin against God. Nothing is unclean of itself. What it is is our response to God's command. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not a bad thing. God said it was good. And then he made man, said they're not evil, they're very good. Uh, and so, but the problem was the command associated with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was do not eat. And they crossed that command. If they had left it alone or waited for God to say, now is the appropriate time. I told you before not to eat, but I've explained some things to you and now we can do it together. Uh, then it still would have been good. But what made it evil was their disobedience to God's command. Uh, and so uh, that's why the scripture says in Psalms, I forgot to look up the, uh, uh, the, the reference, do not revile the gods. I want to stand up here and call the devil a dirty blankety blank son of a blankety blank. I really do. But the scripture commands us not to revile the gods. In fact, in uh, the, the book of Jude, Michael wouldn't even rebuke the devil. He said, the Lord rebuke thee. In fact, in Zechariah, the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord, wouldn't even rebuke Satan. He turned to his father and said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, because Jesus had not become incarnate, and he had not risen from the dead and been given the power, uh, all authority in heaven and on earth, so he couldn't even rebuke the devil. You know what? He was considering Satan, in a sense, holy. Not obedient, not someone to follow uh, his example, not someone to listen to his words, but he was letting God's creation uh, work out in the way that God designed and intended. And so uh, when we look at other people and we, we decide 
that we can pass judgment on them. There's no way that they're saved because they did or said so, you know, something like that. Or there's no way they can ever be saved because they crossed the line and did something that God could never forgive. Uh, let God decide that, but to us, let them be holy. Let them be either currently children of God through faith in Jesus Christ or potential children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Just think of the worst person you could possibly imagine, either current or in history, and know that if they had trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, they would be in heaven with the rest of the saints. So God says, uh, don't esteem anything unclean in and of itself. Okay? Uh, that's, why, that's why he got into the stuff about eating. If you like steak, have steak. If you don't like meat, don't have meat. If you like legumes, if you like Brussels sprouts... I actually do. I know that's weird, but they're really good. Teresa makes them with almonds, olive oil, and salt, and they're amazing. Uh, nothing's unclean of, of, of itself. And as I said, that potential for sin that was latent in the, in the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was not unclean until they disobeyed God. Then it became an unclean thing. That's why they walked in shame, not because the tree was evil, but because they had done evil. All right. Uh, now, we go to chapter 15, and he says... Uh, in verse 6, no, in verse 5, Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another according to Jesus Christ. So he says, in Christ, be like-minded, that is, have the same mind, have the same thoughts towards one another. In verse 6, that you may with one mind and mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we spent a lot more time focusing on what we either can or should be agreeing on, which is the glory and majesty of Almighty God, which is the beauty and grace of Jesus Christ, which is the presence and power of the Holy Spirit of God, instead of arguing about uh, human gods on earth known as the ravens and stealers, uh, known as uh, your favorite American idols, uh, your favorite uh, uh, hip-hop stars, your favorite Hollywood actors, uh, instead of focusing on things here, we could be like-minded and praising and glorifying God and have a lot more to agree about. But we're too busy arguing about uh, how to cut your grass and which, uh, which person to, to put in office that's going to do about the same thing as the person before them did. Uh, instead of glorifying and praising and worshiping and serving Jesus Christ and being like-minded towards God and bringing glory to the Father. Now, all those things are nice distractions from time to time, but we have turned the distractions into the main thing. Um, now, I don't have a dog in the fight as far as football. I'm ashamed of my football team this year. Uh, but, uh, well, I'm, I'm just thankful for that. Thank you, God, for taking that away from me <laughs> so I can focus on more important things. Uh, and, and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of times when I've been out investing way too much time in a hobby or a distraction, and God has taken the joy right out of it so that I get back to what really matters. And I'm thankful for that. Be like-minded. You know it's possible for all of God's people to agree on something. Every one of us to agree on something. That's exciting. I don't know about anyone else. There are very few times, but, but I've noticed them where we're all in agreement because we're all focused on the right thing. And because God is singular and because God is uh, unchanging, it's impossible to disagree on God, on his person, on his character, on his work, if we're focused on him. If we get to talking about, uh, you know, whether the baptism should be sprinkling or dunking or dunking once or dunking three times or what color the carpet should be or if there should be lots of candles or no candles or a couple candles or a cross or no cross get to arguing about stuff that's not in the scripture and uh, then we're not going to be like minded but if we focus on him if we focus on what is revealed about God what he's done for us and through us and what he expects from us from the pages of the Bible then we can be in, in total agreement I'm, I'm blessed by that there's not a lot of agreement in the world today, but we can be, be all in agreement about what really matters. That's the person and work of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now, he says um, in verse 13, 
The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And again, words that I think are instructive and, and needed today. We, does anyone else ever get just caught up in what's wrong? There's a lot wrong. I said this uh, last week or the week before. I think most of our elected officials, whether here in the United States or dictators abroad or premiers or prime ministers abroad or kings, uh, uh, whatever they call themselves, I, I think most of them hate the people they govern and uh, don't care a whit about their, their subjects or their, uh, the people they claim to represent other than that they can uh, provide them with more wealth and more uh, prestige. There's a lot wrong in the world today. But we can abound in hope. It doesn't just say have a little bit of hope. Abound in hope. And so I'm going to challenge you, something that God's been challenging me with recently, is whenever I start going through a long list, a litany, whether in my mind or in conversation with another person or in prayer, of what's wrong and what scares me and what I'm concerned about and what frustrates me and what angers me in the world today, conclude it with, but God's bigger than that. And he's not surprised. You know, the last year and a half, we've been acting as if God didn't know COVID was going to come along. We've been acting as if uh, God didn't know that there would be riots. We've been acting as if God didn't know that people were going to uh, be oppressed and be killed and, 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 and be put in prison for their faith. God's bigger than that. God's not surprised. Uh, so, yes, go ahead and complain. Go ahead and acknowledge what's wrong with the world. But abound in hope. God said, I'll make your enemies your footstools. So if we approach this with the proper mindset, everything that's wrong with the world just proves that God's that much greater. Because he's standing on it. I love that example of the disciples being out on the Sea of Galilee, alone in a ship in the midst of a storm and the boat rocking and about to capsize. And the same waves that were rocking the boat and about to drown them were the waves that were under Jesus' feet as he walked out to meet them. I heard a preacher once say, we have a God who walks on our problems. He says in, uh, this is just a matter of historical record, maybe, uh, maybe uh, interesting to you as it is me, uh, we're, we're told through church history that, uh, that Peter went and preached the gospel in Rome. But in chapter 15 and verse 20, it says, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. So he said, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to go to somewhere where Thomas has already been, or Peter has already been, or, or uh, uh, Matthew has already been. I want to go somewhere where the gospel hasn't been preached. And then... He spends chapter 16 saying, I want to come and see you all. Which means, at least at the time that the epistle to the Romans was penned, Peter had never been there. Paul wouldn't come to, to somewhere where Peter had been and preached the gospel and established a church. He, again, he didn't want to waste time. He didn't want to waste effort. He didn't want to duplicate other people's work. He wanted to go where, where, where new ground was to be broken. And so at least, as, and, and if you look down through the litany of uh, names of the Christians and the saints there in Rome, uh, Peter's not among them. Do you think maybe Paul would have mentioned a fellow apostle in Jesus Christ having been to a city that he wanted to come visit? Just perhaps. Just a little place where a church, uh, the secular church history and the Bible uh, are at odds with one another. Now, he says, uh, I go now in verse 25 of chapter uh, 15, I go now unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For please them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors, and debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. So he considered a monetary offering to bless the poor people of Jerusalem, a, uh, a fruit, 
And that matches with Philippians chapter 4 and verse 17. Philippians 4, 17. Where he says, after having talked about the, uh, the offering uh, that was given by the church in, in Macedonia, he says in verse 17, Not because I desire a gift, but that I desire fruit that may abound to your account. The only uh, valid reason for a preacher or a deacon or a minister or a Sunday school teacher to request that the people of their church or uh, congregation or assembly give an offering is that fruit may abound to their account. Uh, that is that when we get to heaven, we'll be shocked at how God was able to use funds that we just dropped into a plate or dropped into an envelope in the mailbox or uh, uh, click the button on a computer with our credit cards, we'll be shocked at how God was able to multiply them and use them for something powerful, and we will be rewarded for those things in heaven. And Paul said, uh, it's wonderful if you want to give, I'll, I'll take it, but I don't need it. I want you to have something extra to worship and praise God with when you get to heaven. I don't just want you to be saved, I want you to be saved abundantly. I don't just want you to make it through the fire. I want you to make it through the fire with some gold and silver and some, and some crowns and some, and some trophies and some rewards that you can worship God with and cast at his feet and say, we're not worthy. Uh, we understand that you've marked what we did. We understand that you've rewarded us for our service and for our, and for our generosity. But, uh, but you alone are to be praised and worshiped. The crowns come off our heads. The rewards come out of our arms. And they're cast at the feet of Jesus and someone who just made it through themselves may present themselves. I'm here, Lord. You saved me. You died for me. You shed your blood for me. And I'm here, but I've got nothing else to offer. But people that give in the Spirit and serve in the Spirit, it says, will be rewarded. Uh, there's a, there's a, sometimes when you argue child psychology and how to rear children properly and how to uh, have a healthy family, they say, well, I don't give my kid any rewards for doing the dishes or for mowing the lawn or for cleaning their room because they should be doing that anyway. Well, our Heavenly Father gives us rewards for doing things that we should be doing anyway. He's not only, uh, let's say rabid, he not only hates sin and roots it out in our lives and gets rid of things that are destructive, but he generously and lovingly and graciously rewards us for doing things that we ought to be doing anyway. What an awesome God. There is, no, there is no God who is able to save his people. Every other religion, you've got to save yourself. And there's no other God who gives so generously to people what we, so, uh, we, what we don't deserve. Anyone else for by the grace of God, just thank him for it, praise him for it, and know that you can give and serve, and, and it's God's taking note of it. He will have something waiting for you if it's wrought in the spirit. Not for selfish gain, but if it's wrought in the spirit, he will have a reward waiting for you in heaven for it. What a blessing. Now, there's a lot of talk about Paul because of what he wrote in 1 Corinthians about women keeping silent in the church, and I suffer not a woman to, te uh, to teach. Uh, that, that Paul had something against women. He had a hang-up with women. Note chapter 16, verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that you assist her in whatever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a sucker of many and also uh, of myself. So he opens chapter 16 Naming the saints that are either going through Rome or eventually going to get to Rome or have been in Rome a long time with Phoebe, our sister. You know, the scripture is so awesome in the sense that if you've got someone that doesn't like woman, women in one uh, book, uh, he's not going to first open up the list of people to be commended and served with a woman. This has got to be written by the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, the Bible also uh, is man telling on himself. If it's man's book. Uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, if, 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 if anyone today has tried to start a religion with a verse like that in their holy scripture, 
uh, they'd be, you know, they wouldn't have a religion. They would have no followers whatsoever. The Bible sits there and picks our, our minds and our hearts apart and exposes them for the wretched filthiness that they are outside of Christ. And then you have religions that tell man how horrible he is and tell him what he needs to do to make up for it. And the Bible says we can't, but God has. There's no way on earth that this book came from the mind of men. It came from the Holy Spirit of God through men. In fact, it wasn't Paul's hand that was, uh, that was on the pen. He says in verse 22, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salutes you in the Lord. So now if you don't agree with anything in Romans, you can't even blame it on Paul. You've got to blame it on Tertius. No one knows who he is. You better just leave it up to God. Just say, God, it's your book. I believe it. I'll, I'll do my best to obey it, to practice it, to follow it. But if anything that I believe comes up against something that Scripture teaches, I'm going uh, to bend the knee and yield my beliefs to what God's Word says. By the way, Paul didn't have anything against women. That's just, that just nonsense. You can... Uh, well, anyway. Uh, he, he, he loved everyone. Um, in verse 4, this is very literal. About Priscilla and Aquila, he said they've laid down their necks. Uh, that that that's an expression today. That means my neck's on the line, or I'm on the chopping block. We we say that when someone's about to get fired. We say that when uh, someone you know coach is about to get dismissed from coaching the team. We say that uh, when someone goes to bat for someone else on social media. I'm putting my neck on the line for you. Uh, no, this is very literal. If you supported Jesus Christ or His people in this day, you were laying down your neck. You were uh, liable to be beheaded, hung, burned alive. Uh, tortured, you name it. So don't just... Yes, they were maybe ostracized a little bit from their community in supporting the cause of Jesus Christ and supporting this crazy apostle named Paul, but they were literally putting their lives on the line for him. And our brothers and sisters around the world continue to do that today. In verse 17, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Uh, for the, uh, they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And Paul said in first, uh, 2 Corinthians that he was known as a great writer, but a poor speaker. And all of a sudden these uh, ultra apostles or super apostles come in, and they're smooth talkers. And they've got lots of good words uh, to string together, and, and they're leading people astray from the doctrine that Paul had preached in Corinth as well as written in those epistles. He says, fair speeches and uh, good words deceive the hearts of the simple. And I look around, and especially in American Christians today, and I see a lot of deception, uh, whether on television, whether on social media, whether on YouTube. I see a lot of uh, fair speeches and good words being used to lead people as, uh, aside from the cause of Jesus Christ, from the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ died for our sins, they're not even admitting that men are sinners anymore. God loves you so much. He thinks you're so awesome. He wants you in heaven so bad.